day five. Jake awoke around 8 a.m. the next morning. He heard Steve snoring. He realized they made it through an uneventful night. He got out of bed and got dressed trying to be as quiet as he could so he wouldn't wake Steve. He walked to the kitchen and put the lantern out. He opened the blinds and curtains in the kitchen and returned to the living room to do the same. Since Steve slept in the spare bed in his room, they decided to keep the other bedroom door closed. Steve only opened it when he needed to get a change of clothes or something from his duffel bag. Jake left the door closed. He went back into the kitchen and got a fire going in the stove. He got the coffee pot ready and sat it down on the counter. He walked over to the door and pried the board loose. He grabbed the coffee pot and the pan he used to make the mac and cheese in last night and stepped onto the porch and pumped them full of water. He stepped into the kitchen and put both the coffee pot and pot of water on the stove. He wanted to heat some water to bathe and shave with. He had two options when it came to bathing. Either heat water on the stove and take a bird bath or take a bar of soap and swim in the river. Jake opted for the former because the river was still much too cold. Jake finished shaving and getting cleaned up when Steve walked into the kitchen. I heated enough water for you to shave and bathe. I'm going to go out to the porch to smoke and drink my coffee. That should give you enough privacy to do what you need to do. Steve said, good because I need to get cleaned up, as he left to get a few toiletries from his duffel bag. Jake picked up his coffee and cigarettes and stepped onto the porch. The sun shined brightly in the early morning sky. Nothing seemed worse for wear on the porch or in the front yard. Jake noticed how strong the pine scent was this morning as he stood and wandered to the end of the house. The dew was heavy on the tall grass and he got his feet wet on the way. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, they didn't get any visitors last night. He wondered if maybe the creatures retreated farther back into the woods since he and Steve didn't back down and flee. Yesterday was uneventful except for the wood knock he heard early yesterday morning and the distant scream he and Steve heard yesterday evening. Jake thought, maybe we can begin to enjoy our vacation again and not have to remain cooped up near and inside the house. I'll have to get Steve's opinion on this matter. Steve finally stepped from the kitchen and sat on the porch swing with his cup of coffee. I'm happy you're finished. I need to get a second cup of coffee, Jake said. Steve chuckled. I don't have anything to hide. You could have come in earlier and it wouldn't have bothered me for you to see me naked and getting cleaned up. Jake fetched another cup of coffee and stepped back onto the porch. What do you think happened to the monsters? Yesterday was pretty uneventful and it doesn't look like anything has passed through the yard last night. It seems like the monsters moved farther back into the woods. Who knows, Steve said after he took a sip of coffee, I don't know what happened to them. I wouldn't mind getting back to my vacation. I don't want to have to stay close to the house all of the time. We need to remain vigilant and carry some sort of protection with us when we're outside though. I agree, Jake said and asked, would you like to go fishing down the river near the ford in the main part of the river? I know of another hole of water in that area that isn't as secluded as the one behind the barn. That sounds great, but I want to wait until after lunch to fish so the sun will be directly overhead. I can't argue with that, Jake said. We can head out after lunch. Instead of eating here, why don't we take a sandwich with us and eat while we fish? Steve said, that sounds like a good idea. A picnic. They spent the rest of the morning and sat on the porch and talked and got their fishing gear together. Jake needed to use the facilities before they left so he grabbed the axe along with a replacement roll of toilet paper and headed to the outhouse. Before he stepped off of the porch he asked, why don't you make us both a sandwich and when I get back from the outhouse we can go? Okay, that's a good idea. I guess I can do that. What kind of sandwich do you want? Ham and Swiss with mayo and mustard, Jake said. Bag us up some potato chips too. Steve stood and waited with all his fishing gear, the hatchet and his rucksack near the wash house for Jake to return. Jake stopped to grab his cigarettes and lighter from the porch and locked the front door. He picked up his fishing gear and joined Steve. They walked down the road toward the ford. When they approached the ford, Jake said, we need to take the path up the hill to the left toward the swinging bridge. We can pick up a trail under it which runs along the river and follow it to the other fishing hole. It's just a short distance downstream. Steve led the way while they remained vigilant and made their way down the path. They made it to his small sandbar which sat six feet away from the riverbank. The sandbar was connected to the end of the path they took along the river. The sandbar was separated from the riverbank by a narrow stream of water which they would have had to wade through if they took the main path to the fishing hole. 
The main path would have them cut through the neighbor's property, something Jake didn't want to do. When they walked on the sandbar, they decided this was where they would spend their day fishing. This fishing hole was located at one of the widest points of the main river in the immediate area. The tree canopies were held at bay on both sides of the river, and this allowed the sun to shine brightly without being impeded by the trees. Steve got his sling chair set up as soon as he hit the sandbar. Jake walked another five yards on down the river before he set up his chair. Steve cast his line and let the current carry it down the river a short distance before he set his reel. Jake did the same. With the water level up, the river swept past faster than it normally would during the summer months. The swiftness of the current carried their hooks back toward shore, so they had to reel their lines in and recast to the middle of the river. After the fourth time doing this, Jake said, start casting upstream in the opposite direction. That'll provide more time for our hooks to remain in the water. It's pointless to fish with sinkers because the current will carry them under a rock where it'll get stuck. This will cause us to have to constantly cut the line and re-rig our poles. They continued to fish this way for another hour before they had had enough. Neither of them got any bites anyway. Jake said, why don't we pack up and head back to the swinging bridge where we can talk without having to shout over the din of the river. Steve agreed and picked up his gear and led the way back toward the bridge. Once at the bridge, Jake said, let's cross the bridge and fish in an old pond on the White's property across the river. No one lives there and the property's been abandoned for many years. I'm not keen on the idea of being so far away from the house, Steve said. As he pointed across the river in the direction of the White's property, Jake said, the pond is only a couple miles up the road and we can drive the car to within a short walking distance of it. There's been no sign of the creatures since the day before yesterday, and I fully believe because we didn't give up and leave, they retreated back into the woods. Steve was convinced they were in no immediate danger and said, if something happens while we're fishing at the pond, we can easily jump into the car and leave. Jake nodded, go ahead and cross the bridge and wait near the car. I need to piss. Steve crossed the bridge while Jake turned his back to him to take care of his business. After he finished up, he regathered his gear and crossed the bridge to join Steve. When he reached the center of the bridge, he noticed Steve had sat his fishing gear down and walked around the car as he looked at the ground. Jake shouted, what are you looking at? You'll see, Steve shouted before he bent down out of sight on the other side of the car. Jake hurried across the bridge curious to see what Steve had found. When he approached his car, it became obvious. There were three distinct sets of giant footprints which circled Jake's car in the hard and compacted sand. Jake set his gear down and walked around the car to see if there was any damage to it. As he walked around the car, he didn't notice any outright damage, but he did notice what appeared to be a giant handprint on the back window on the driver's side. The handprint was located near the bottom of the glass where the trunk lid met the back window. It was obvious the print was from a right hand because the offset thumb pointed to the left. Jake pointed the print out to Steve and Steve wanted to take a closer look. He placed his right hand next to the print and the print dwarfed his hand. The print was five inches longer and considerably wider than his hand. Steve muttered just under his breath, these fuckers are everywhere around here. Just as Steve said muttered his last word, they heard a large branch snap directly across the road. They both looked up and saw a gigantic black hairy beast glaring at them from just inside the tree line. Once the beast realized they spotted it, it took a menacing step toward them into the road. It reared its head back and let out a deafening howl. The sheer volume of the howl was disorienting. It came at them from every direction. It was so loud Jake could feel his chest cavity vibrate. After he got his bearings, Jake grabbed the axe and hatchet and grabbed Steve by the arm and dragged him toward the bridge and left everything else behind. When they were halfway across the bridge, they briefly stopped and looked back to see if the creature was going to give chase. It was apparent it took a few more steps in their direction, but it stopped and stood there. It growled at them and showed them its huge teeth. Spittle dripped from its mouth. They turned and continued across the bridge. When they walked down the bridge steps they heard, another creature howl a short distance upriver from where they were. The howl sounded like it was on their side of the river and was getting closer. Come on! Jake said as he quickened his pace, we've got to get back to the house and fast. While they ran from the bridge, Jake handed the hatchet to Steve. They ran as fast as they could back to the house. They looked over their shoulders the entire way to see if either creature chased them. 
They never saw the creatures, but they continued to hear one of them howl. The howl remained stationary, so this indicated at least one creature remained behind and didn't give chase. They weren't sure where the other one might be. They suspected the first creature they saw on the other side of the river was the one who remained stationary because the howls they heard came from that direction. Jake hurriedly unlocked the door and they ran inside and nailed it shut behind them. Steve laid the hatchet on the table and Jake laid the axe down beside it. Jake picked up the hammer while Steve placed the board across the door and held it in position while Jake nailed it to the door frame. He put the hammer down and sat at the table. Steve followed suit. Jake reached into the cooler and got him and Steve a cold bottle of water. Jake opened his bottle and took a couple of big gulps. He set the bottle on the table and reached into his pocket for his cigarettes and lighter. They weren't there. It dawned on him he had left them in his tackle box and they left all their gear next to the car when they made their escape. Jake wondered what they were going to do because they didn't have any way to light a fire or the lanterns. He remembered he packed an extra lighter in his duffel bag in case the one he used ran out of lighter fluid. They remained silent while they sat at the table and listened for any sign of the other creature. After they didn't hear anything for several minutes, they decided to pull the board away from the door so they could move onto the porch. Jake said, wait for me before you go back outside because I want to get another pack of cigarettes from my duffel bag and make sure my extra lighter is there. Jake got another pack of cigarettes but had a tough time as he searched for his extra lighter. He found it all the way down in the bottom of his bag. He headed to the kitchen and they stepped outside. They walked to the edge of the porch and looked down the road to see if they could see anything. They didn't see or hear anything. Steve said, if the creature we heard scream on our side of the river was trying to sneak up on us, it would probably do so under the cover of the trees. I don't think it would run up the middle of the road after us. Jake shook his head, don't throw out that possibility because that would be the creature's easiest way to travel. Especially if the creature intended to get somewhere quickly. Its path wouldn't be obstructed like it would through the trees. Steve asked, what are we going to do about all our fishing gear? The creatures can have it. I'm not going to risk my life over a few of fishing poles, two tackle boxes, and a couple sling chairs. Steve laughed. I wouldn't either. Maybe the creatures will figure out how to use all of that stuff. Wouldn't it be funny to see them sit along the riverbank in our sling chairs with a rod and reel in their hands? Jake laughed. It's plausible because they figured out how to unlatch the barnyard gate. They continued to sit on the porch for several hours and talk about how they would escape. Jake said, trying to get to the car will be a crazy idea because it looks like the creatures are watching it and waiting for us to try to attempt it. Steve ran his fingers through his hair. Yeah, we're gonna have to stick with our original plan and wait for the neighbors to come or the two hillbillies we saw the other day. Jake stood up and paced back and forth. We're gonna have to flag them down and ask them for help. Hopefully one or both of them will have guns and either cover us when we run to the car or loan us a couple of their guns. Yeah, it seems like the only way we'll be able to escape this madness is to shoot the creatures which try and stop us. Jake nodded his head several times and sat. Dusk approached and Jake said, we're gonna have to go to the woodpile and bring a couple more. Loads of firewood back to the house. Go light both lanterns and follow me out there. Jake and Steve each retrieved one load of wood and put it in the wood box in the kitchen. They were on their way back with their second load when Jake heard a large branch snap on the island across the river when he walked past the wash house. He was several steps ahead of Steve and he looked across to the island. Jake stopped. As Steve approached Jake whispered, there's a Bigfoot standing on the island behind a tree. It's peeking out from behind a tree at us. My lantern is illuminating its outline. I can see its upper torso, shoulders, and head. Its eyes are glowing bright yellow in the lantern light. Don't look directly at it. It might perceive it as a threat and attack us. Let's hurry up and get the wood inside the house. Steve nodded. They made it back to the house and deposited the wood into the wood box. It's time to close and nail the door shut, Jake said. It appears the creatures are watching us, and I doubt if the one I just saw is by itself. Steve said, it's probably not. Jake secured the door while Steve walked through the house and pulled the blinds and closed the curtains on the windows. Jake started a fire in the stove. Leave one lantern burn in the living room and we'll keep the other one with us in here. 
I'm gonna reheat the mac and cheese from last night so we can eat it along with a sandwich for dinner. That sounds good, Steve said as his stomach growled. I'm getting hungry. Jake thought and remembered they never did get a chance to eat the sandwiches Steve packed to take fishing with them earlier. He also remembered neither of them had eaten anything since dinner the night before. They finished their dinner and Jake busied himself and cleaned the kitchen. He put a few more pieces of firewood in the stove and heated up the leftover coffee. There was about a half pot of coffee left. Would you like a cup of coffee? Jake asked. It'll probably be a long night. We'll need the coffee to help keep us awake. Steve said, as soon as it's ready, you can pour me a cup. Steve had no sooner said that when it sounded like something broke through the front window in the living room. They raced into the living room to see what happened. They discovered a white-tailed deer laying in the broken frame. It was alive. They saw its front legs twitch. It appeared the deer had its head twisted backward. Its neck was wrung. Its eyes rolled back into its head and its tongue hung out. Blood came from the deer's nose and mouth and pooled on the floor underneath the window. Beyond the window, they saw a big footstep off the porch and turn right and head to the side of the house toward the barnyard. Steve's jaw dropped. While he rubbed his eyes, he said, what are we going to do about this deer? Jake's eyes widened and his jaw dropped. More importantly, what are we going to do about the broken window? They looked at the deer which had died from its injuries. Jake said, help me push it back through the window and onto the porch. When they lifted the front of the deer and got ready to push it back through the window, something grabbed it by its back legs and yanked it free from the window and out of their hands. Another Bigfoot stood against the front of the house next to the window where they couldn't see it. Steve screamed as the jerk. They jumped away from the window and backed up to the center of the living room. They saw the second Bigfoot tuck the deer under its right arm and casually head off in the direction the first one did. They tried to contain their rapid breathing while they listened to see if they could hear any more movement on the porch. After a few minutes, they were convinced there were no more creatures out there. After they calmed down, Jake asked, will you please go to the junk drawer in the kitchen and see if you can find a screwdriver? Yeah, where can I find one? Steve asked. Jake said, there should be a set in one of the kitchen drawers as he retrieved the broom, dustpan, and a wet rag to clean up the mess in the living room. Steve returned with both a flat head and Phillips head screwdriver. Will one of these work? Jake looked at the screwdrivers and said, yeah, take the mirror off the dresser over there. As he glanced at the dresser beside the guest room door, the mirror should be big enough to cover the entire window. Steve looked at the mirror. I don't think it'll work. Jake cleaned up the broken glass and the blood and set the broom, dustpan, and rag down next to the kitchen door. He helped Steve carry the heavy mirror from the dresser to the broken window and sat it down on the windowsill. Jake said, hold the mirror in place while I go to get the hammer and nails from the kitchen so we can nail it into place over the broken window. A few seconds later, Jake returned and helped Steve move the mirror around and got it centered over the window opening. The mirror was an old bevel glass mirror inside a wide oak frame. It was completely encased in oak. One large oak board covered the back of it. The frame which encircled the mirror itself was six inches wide and provided enough nailing room to drive several nails through it without nailing close to the glass. The mirror faced inside the house. Steve looked at his reflection in the mirror. What would happen if we turn the mirror around so it faces out to the porch? Jake raised his eyebrows and looked at Steve. What difference would that make? Think about it, Steve said as he looked at Jake. Yeah? I still don't understand what difference it'll make. What if the creatures came back onto the porch and saw their reflections in the mirror? Jake shook his head because he still didn't understand the point Steve tried to make. Steve looked back at the mirror. The creatures might be frightened by their own reflection. I doubt that, Jake said. What if their reflections only serve to piss them off even more than they already are? What if they think one of their kind is already inside the house and they break through the mirror to get inside as well? Steve glanced toward the floor. I didn't think of that. It took a couple minutes to get the mirror nailed to the window frame. The mirror faced inward to the living room. They retreated into the kitchen and Jake warmed their coffee. He emptied the coffee pot of its spent grounds and replaced them with new ones and made a fresh pot. It seems we're gonna have to board up all the windows throughout the house. 
It's only going to be a matter of time before one of those things gets inside. Steve nodded. Jake said, there ain't enough wood inside the house to board up all the windows. We can't simply chop up all the furniture. We'll have to get some more boards from the barn tomorrow, Steve said. We can remove the interior doors from their hinges and use them to board up three other windows tonight. Steve nodded and stretched. That's a good idea. I would never have thought of that. Jake said, after we finish our coffee, we should start with the door to the guest room. We can use its door to board up that window first because it's on the end of the house near the barnyard. It seems something on that end of the house is what the creatures are most fascinated with. That's where they're doing the most damage. It didn't take them long to remove the three interior doors and board up three windows. They started with the end bedroom window. Then they removed the door to the master bedroom and used it to board up the window on the back wall of the living room. Next, they removed the door between the kitchen and living room and used it to board up the back kitchen window. The windows remained which needed boarded up, two in the kitchen and two in the master bedroom. The two in the kitchen included the one on the side of the house which faced the cellar and the one on the front wall near the kitchen sink. The other windows in the bedroom included the one which faced the front yard and the one in the middle of the room which faced the lane. They finished and returned to the kitchen and sat at the table. Steve said, we need to decide on one window to leave uncovered. Why? Jake asked his brows furrowed and eyes narrowed. Steve said, what if, just by chance, one of those creatures makes it into the house? How in the hell are we going to get out if all of the windows are boarded up? Good thinking. Which window would you consider leaving uncovered? Steve ran his hand through his hair and sucked his teeth. We should leave the window in the master bedroom which faces the front yard uncovered. Why that one? Jake asked, his eyebrows raised. Steve sat upright and leaned forward. That window will be the easiest to escape through because the bottom of it is close to the ground and it provides a view of the front yard. We can easily look out of it to see if any more creatures are waiting on us outside. It might be difficult to hear if a creature gets into any other part of the house while we sleep. Being the only time we're really in that room is at night while we sleep, and that makes it a lot easier to monitor. Jake nodded, his eyes flashed. What happens if that's the window one of these things decides to break through while we're sleeping? We should have enough time to react and get out of the room because it'll be easier to hear it breaking through that window than if one broke in anywhere else in the house, Steve said as he leaned back in his chair. I agree, Jake said as he let out a deep breath and sat back in his chair. You have a good point. We should leave the hammer in the kitchen by the front door though. That's so we can easily remove the board to get out if we have to. Yeah, that makes sense. Jake sat up and leaned over the table. Did you get a good look at the Bigfoot which stepped out of the tree line when we were at the car earlier? I suppose so, Steve said as he glanced to his left and looked up toward the ceiling. How tall do you think it was? I'm guessing it was between 8.5 to 9 feet tall, Steve said as he continued to glance toward the ceiling. Yeah, Jake said. However, I'm leaning more toward it standing at 9 feet tall. Did you get a good look at its face? The creature's dark, widespread eyes definitely showed anger under a large protruding brow ridge, Steve said. The creature's skin was really cracked and leathery. Like an old catcher's mitt? Jake asked. Yeah, that's a perfect description, Steve said as he sat upright in his chair and looked at Jake. Its nose resembled the nose of a gorilla. The bridge of its nose protruded slightly and it had large flaring nostrils. Its nose was extremely wide. Before it tilted its head back and howled I got a good look at its lips. Its lips seemed thin for a creature of its immense size and stature. Its lips looked nothing like human lips. They closely resembled the lips of a chimpanzee. Jake nodded and asked, did you see how its face wasn't completely covered in hair? Did you notice how the upper cheeks and the area around its eyes was bare? I did notice that. Its head hair reminded me of a long-haired hippie. Its hair was shoulder length but got a little shorter as it grew up to the top of its pointed head. The hair on its head looked lighter brown. Compared to the hair over the rest of its body, it also sported a long beard. I agree, Jake said and asked, did you see its ears? No, but I suspect they were covered by its longer head hair. I didn't see the ears either and it's plausible its long head hair covered them, Jake said. I imagine they have ears which resemble human or chimpanzee ears. Who knows? 
Jake said, it looked to me like its overall hair color was a dark chocolate brown, almost black, and the hair on its head was a milk chocolate color. Steve nodded. For obvious reasons, I think we can both conclude it was definitely a male, Jake said. Steve chuckled and said, yeah, the creature's genitals were completely visible. Jake fully extended his right arm and looked at it. Did you get the impression its arms were out of proportion to its body? Yeah, Steve said. They looked like they hung below its massive thighs, almost reaching to its knees. Its legs were also long, almost disproportionate to its body. I agree, Jake said. It looked like the tops of its legs would start at or above the middle of my chest. That would make them a little more than four feet long. Did you see its teeth when it threw its head back and howled? I didn't really get a good look at the teeth. When it threw its head back, I turned around to run. I briefly saw its teeth and they were huge, Jake said. If I had to compare them to something familiar, I compare them to the teeth of a horse. I also noticed the canines were unusually larger than what they should be. Not so large as to be protruding out of the, its mouth, but larger than what I consider normal. Nonetheless, if you remember, I grabbed you by the arm and dragged you toward the bridge when it started to howl. Yeah, I forgot about that. I was so scared I felt like I was running in place. Everything seemed to move in slow motion. Jake said, I've heard stories from people who say things seem to move in slow motion when they're extremely scared. I have too, but I've never experienced it. Jake asked, how much do you think it weighed? If I had to guess, I'd have to say between 800 to 900 pounds. Jake said, that sounds about right. I think it probably weighed that much. I'd estimate about 100 pounds per foot in height. It was extremely broad across its shoulders, but didn't appear to be overweight, Steve said. I agree, Jake said. It looked to be at least 3.5 feet across its shoulders. It was also very muscular. You could see huge muscles through its hair. I'm happy it didn't chase us, Steve said. Jake nodded. It could have easily overpowered us, and I'm thankful as well because we probably wouldn't be sitting here right now if you know what I mean. I hear you. I wonder how many of them are staying around here. Jake said, we know for a fact there are at least three on this side of the river. Remember the other night when we heard the wood knocking come from each end of the property? That accounts for two. We now know the screaming we heard the other night from the hillside came from one as well. That makes three. I suspect the two we saw on the porch earlier are the same two which have been hanging around here. Possibly the one staying in the pig pen and cow stable. I bet one of them is the same one we saw on the island earlier when we gathered firewood. I don't know if the one we heard scream on the hillside the other night is the same one we saw at the car this morning. Maybe they keep different territories on either side of the river. If the one we heard scream from the hillside is not the same one we saw at the car, that means there's at least four of them. I suspect there are even more of them around than the ones we've seen and heard firsthand. Steve said, I'm done talking about this for tonight. I'm scared shitless not knowing when one of them is going to come crashing into the house to kill us. We're trapped here with no possible way to get to the car unless one of the neighbors comes down here to check on the property or the hillbillies come back. Who knows? Even then we might not be able to get out to the road to flag them down without getting attacked by one of these things. Without the car being here next to the house the neighbors might just do a drive-by and not have any real reason to stop if they don't see the car. Jake shook his head. The neighbors should see the car gate open which should cause them to stop to investigate. I'm just as scared as you are. Our chances of getting out of here alive are slim. If we don't see anyone within the next week, our supplies are gonna run out. We only brought enough food to last two weeks. Yeah, we can ration the supplies, but I hate to do that because it looks like we're giving up. I don't wanna give up yet. There's old canned food in the cellar, but it's probably not any good. As long as we can get to the water pump on the porch, we'll not run out of water. That's a good thing. Steve didn't say anything. Jake said, until we can get to the barn and get more boards to cover up the remaining windows, I'll feel safer if we sleep in the living room tonight. We can move the rocking chairs and pull the couches away from the walls to the middle of the room. This will be better than sitting at the table all night. We'll at least be able to stretch out and rest. The living room's in the middle of the house, and we can hear if something tries to get in through a kitchen or bedroom window. Besides, I don't want to sleep too close to the uncovered windows in the bedroom anyway. I don't blame you, Steve said. I wouldn't either. They walked into the living room and moved the rocking chairs out of the way. 
They moved the two couches to the middle of the room. They positioned them with their backs together. Jake said, I'll lay facing in one direction while you lay facing in the other. This way, we'll be able to see in both directions. I also think we should leave both lanterns burn. We should leave one in the kitchen and the other in the master bedroom. We need to be careful with the lanterns though. When we move around them inside the house, they'll cast our shadows on the curtains on the windows we haven't boarded up yet. This will give our positions away inside the house if the creatures are outside and watching. Steve nodded. I would have never have thought of that. Jake said, I'll quickly take the lantern into the bedroom and get us a couple of blankets and pillows and leave the lantern sit on the floor in the corner between both uncovered windows. I figure by placing it there, the only shadows I'll cast will be back into the room and not onto the windows. I wouldn't have thought of that either, Steve said as he shook his head, a corner of his mouth lifted. Jake walked into the living room when one of the creatures howled. It sounded like it was outside the house near the kitchen. Steve jumped off the couch and they stood there and listened. It was a long, drawn out, mournful howl. Jake guessed the howl lasted for 20 seconds or more. It almost sounded like an air raid siren. It started off low, raised in pitch until it leveled off, and dropped down again until it faded away. The creature's howls were intense. Just as the first howl stopped, another one started on the other end of the house near the barnyard. Jake said, they have us surrounded. Just as he said that something smacked the back wall of the house in the living room near the window they had nailed the door over earlier. There was no doubt in Jake's mind the creatures had them completely surrounded. Jake looked at Steve and said, sit down on the couch. I'll crawl into the kitchen to get the axe, hatchet, and both flashlights. The lantern sat on the kitchen table, so if Jake walked in there the light would cast a shadow on the front and in windows. Because it sounded like the first howl came from just outside the end window, he didn't want the creatures to know where he was inside the house. He got down on his hands and knees and crawled through the kitchen doorway and tried to be as quiet as possible. He crawled around the kitchen table to get the axe and hatchet which were on top of the firewood box. He was careful not to make any noise because the box sat underneath the end kitchen window and he didn't want the creature to reach through the window and grab him. He picked the axe and hatchet up from off of the top of the box and backed away from the window while he kept his eyes on it the entire time. He slowly turned and placed the axe and hatchet carefully into his left hand so he wouldn't clank them together. He turned completely around and quietly pulled both flashlights from off the top of the table with his right hand. Steve, on his hands and knees, met Jake in the doorway between the kitchen and living room to help. Jake whispered, it's hard to crawl around on the floor with both hands full. Steve took the flashlights from Jake and they crawled back over to and upon the couches. Jake handed Steve the hatchet and Steve handed Jake a flashlight. Jake whispered, we're gonna have to remain calm if we're gonna survive the night. We can't let the creatures know where we are inside the house. Jake looked at Steve and Steve shuddered. Tears streamed down his face. Jake truly felt sorry for him because he was just as scared as Steve looked. Jake whispered, we're gonna have to be extremely quiet for a while and listen to see where the creatures are outside the house. Steve nodded. They sat there for the next couple hours while they clutched their weapons to their chests. They prayed. They waited. They strained to listen. They were scared out of their minds. They both prayed one of these things didn't crash through one of the uncovered windows and get inside the house. Jake awakened several hours later and noticed Steve was asleep. Jake was angry they had allowed themselves to fall asleep. He was happy at the same time because they were still alive. He noticed sunlight as it came through the cracks around the boarded windows. He sat up and reached over the back of the couch and gently placed his hand on Steve's right shoulder to wake him. Steve woke with a start. Jake whispered, Somehow, by the grace of God, we made it through the night. Jake's watch said it was 8.23 a.m. Please tune in next week as we continue on with the next installment of A Journey Through Hell and Back. For those who cannot wait, this title is available on Amazon.com. A link to the book is available in the description below the video. Please remember to like and subscribe so you won't miss out on the continuing saga.